Thank you. Okay. Uh, excuse me for wearing my jacket. It's, it's supposed to be 26 degrees today. Um, anyway, uh, that's what happens when you leave Europe. Right, so um, <coughs> I'm really delighted to be here, and uh, it's really embarrassing about the OBE, uh, my mother used to call the mother buggers efforts. Um, and that is basically what I, my job is. <laughs> I am a, um, a very passionate uh, uh, fan of what happens in Guildford uh, in particular. Um, and I think that all well, the intro about uh, working together and collaborating, uh, there's never been a more important time for that message uh, for all of us in this country and as a sector. That's why I put there's never been a better time to be together. Um, so in case you didn't know, um, so Yuki is the trade body for the games and interactive entertainment in the UK. And we do a whole bunch of things, which is really just to help your businesses grow. That's the primary reason we exist as a not-for-profit, uh, in order to make um, the UK the best place in the world. And we do that um, by supporting, promoting, and growing the industry. Um, and this is our mission, is to make the UK the best place in the world, to make and sell games and interactive entertainment. Now, we've always been um, prized as one of the most creative uh, nations in the world, and we still are. That does not go away. And we'll go into some of the reasons why we're so creative and innovative. Partly it's to do with our diversity uh, and uh, the kinds of people that we welcome into this country. Um, it's also to do with um, the fact that we have to put up with so much rain. Um, and it's, it's also to do with our resilience. Uh, we are an extremely resilient uh, uh, country um, as a small island. Um, and our education system is absolutely world class. And, and for me, um, education and growing the next generation of talent, as well as helping the talent in the pipeline now and in jobs now, uh, is so, so critical. Never stop learning. This is a phrase that I'm a geographer. I was just having a conversation about uh, my undergrad thesis was about online communities uh, and internet cafes and things like that. And uh, so I was a cultural geographer. And when I was being trained, if you like, you know, this is one of the things, that we, we had this horrendous phrase called global, uh, which I'm not using, but it was this idea that, you know, in a globalized world, you have to still, place still matters, identity still matters. Where you live, who you, you hang around with, your culture, your community influences you. And we leave a little bit of that in traces of that influence throughout all our creative products and all the games that we make. Um, and so, we, as a trade body, need to act locally because we're seeing the growth of all these clusters across the country. We have traditionally been spread across the country as an industry, um, but we are also all digital exporters. Almost all games companies are exporters, uh, and, and you hear the government talking about exporters and 6% of exports, and, and actually, you know, as soon as you put a, a, a game up on the App Store or on Steam or whatever, and it, as someone from outside of UK buys it, you're an exporter. Um, we have some challenges, however, about how government measures that. So regardless of, may, of what may have happened that has meant that I haven't had very much sleep since Friday, um, the UK <laughs> is most definitely still open for business and is a absolutely top key destination, particularly for international games businesses. Um, and we are also a tech uh, innovating uh, uh, nation, and that is important. You know, games have always sat between this kind of funny mid-world between creativity, content, storytelling, fantastic um, art and, and design, uh, but also innovation and technology and the real high-tech skills that we need. And sometimes that means that in government terms or in practical help, we sometimes get we fall between the two stalls because are you tech? I'm a London tech ambassador. And I sit there, and, it, and it, is, it is really important to be part of this group, but I sit there and, and, and I just find it hilarious. We just had London Tech Week, and uh, people say, so um, I, I'm into FinTech. Uh, oh, really? I'm into AgriTech. Well, I'm uh, EduTech. What are you, Joe? Are you, you Games Tech? I said, no, I'm just games. <laughs> it's just, just games. Uh, but it is important that we continue to tell that story. And the other story that we have to continue to tell is the fact that we are, uh, across the UK, not just London, um, a very, very strong sector and growing. There has never been a better time than now uh, to be setting up business in the UK. And we did this bit of research. Again, the government sometimes misses that out. You know, they, they did this famous report about Scotland 
um, uh, uh, a couple of years ago that said basically there wasn't a games industry in Scotland that employs no people. Hello, have you heard of GTA? It's only the biggest, fastest selling entertainment product of all time, by the way, and a really big studio there. Uh, plus lots of other studios and, oh look, Dundee. So we decided if we were in Silicon Valley, we wouldn't take the government's official stats and, and this kind of nonsense because that really influences policy decisions and business environment and confidence. So we said we'd take a big data approach and a bit of more of a modern approach to mapping and finding out who uh, are the companies that make up our fantastic eco ecosystem. So we worked with Nestor on this map and we're now, um, we're sort of soft launching at the moment-ish. <laughs> uh, so you know what it's like with software and projects. We're taking this online, basically, so that this is a living, breathing, dynamic, real-time map um, of all of your companies or activities or who you are, where you are, how many employees you might have, uh, if you're a co-working space, anything. And you can log in, you can register, you can log in and update your information. Then it dynamically maps and you can choose. People tell me all the people in this area who are just working on VR and hopefully it will just deliver you all those results. And this is really important. Again, I'm a geographer, so I like maps. Um, this is a, a snapshot. No one's seen anything of this yet, by the way. Uh, so you're getting a sneak preview. And as with all software, uh, it will iterate. Uh, so you're relying the community to be helping us to iterate and develop it. And you'll be able to basically map o other sets of open data on top of this open database, which means that, for instance, we if, we if, if we need to do some lobbying at a local level uh, with the council, for instance, around your broadband speeds, uh, <laughs> which is a big one. I come up the station and I have E as <laughs> my mobile reception. Um, but we will be able to use data that's publicly available, overlay it into our database and map and see some patterns. And patterns are really, really useful. Um, so it'll be things like this. You'll be able to see local service companies uh, in, in a particular area, which companies, what platforms most of the companies are developing on, local university courses, and so on, which should be extremely useful. Um, and this is extremely useful at a local and a global level. Um, it's useful at a global level because when we, we, we now do quite a lot of trade activity, it's sort of clues in the name, Trade, trade <laughs> Association, and um, we do work with UKTI very closely, who, who do a fantastic job in trying to provide funding and support for companies, especially very small companies, um, to access global marketplaces. For instance, China. Um, China is a huge uh, global uh, marketplace, particularly for mobile games. Um, but a lot of people don't realize internationally the kinds of incentives we have in this country, but also our strengths, particularly around mobile development. Um, they still see us as a nation of uh, console developers, which we are, of course, and we have a 40 plus year history uh, in games. They don't see necessarily that we're also a rich startup entrepreneurial nation in games, and we have a lot of mobile tablet developers. Um, so telling that story through dev, uh, evidence and data is, is really important so that we can attract uh, their interest, either setting up, giving people more jobs, uh, or um, going into partnerships with some of you uh, to make the games you want to make. Um, one of the really, really um, big things for me is about culture. Um, we know that uh, government understands that we're an economic powerhouse, but we're also a cultural powerhouse. And I, my mission is to make games at the heart of the cultural conversation. Sometimes we get, again, missed out in that cultural conversation when people talk about the arts. You know, they, they, they don't consider games necessarily part of the arts. Um, I think culture should be with a small C, not with a big C uh, as well. And so I'm, I'm, I'm on the BAFTA Games Committee, which I'm very passionate about. If, if any of you want to join BAFTA, please do. They, they offer really, really good, helpful um, skills work, and they do a lot of good for the industry. Um, I'm on the British Screen Advisory Council. We talk with the Arts Council. We're lobbying the BFI to release public funding to help make games and grow talent. And I also sit on the Creative Industries Council, um, which is all the creative industries around the table. And it's important to have your voice channeled through me uh, in, a, in a croaky way um, to actually influence and make sure that as soon as people are talking about creative industries or technology, they are talking about games, not just film and TV. We are at the bleeding edge of innovative entertainment and innovation in entertainment. We all know about esports. We've got huge subgroup on esports. Um, the government is now really, really excited about esports, which is a good thing. 
Um, we are also just involved in various other initiatives and we're doing a policy paper to understand what the opportunity for the UK is in esports. Of course, we've heard about uh, what's happening out there with VR. I can't wait to do that. Um, VR and AR, absolutely gigantic uh, opportunity. Um, estimates, you know, around what this market's worth are like, uh, finger in the air, because who knows, right? The great thing is that we're really good at testing things and testing ideas. Someone needs to do the testing, okay? Someone needs to go out there and start doing. And again, the narrative seems to be that this is all happening in America. We know about 150 companies in the UK who are working on VR and AR right now. Um, of course, none of this is relevant unless we secure a diverse talent pipeline. We are very, very, very vocal about STEAM education, not just STEM. Okay, so we got computer science onto the curriculum, that's alpha stage. We now need to make sure that science subjects, computer science, uh, is taken just as seriously with arts and creativity. And I'll show you a little video of a project that we're doing in order to push that through. Public affairs and political engagement is uh, sometimes something that people don't necessarily connect to their everyday jobs and their everyday lives. But I tell you, this is now, and again, since Friday, this is even more important um, than ever to do. Um, the MPs that we talk to uh, are the decision makers. Um, so we need to inspire them, we need to influence them, we need to come to them with proactive, positive messages and ideas of how to grow the industry and to make them look good in <laughs> VR. Um, and we do this through various different ways of engaging with them and educating them. And we bring companies along all the time. So last November, we had a Westminster Games Day where we took over um, Westminster for the entire day. Uh, we had some critical seminars on some really, really big issues uh, that are still at a European level, um, which we have questions around now <laughs> that we're out of Europe. Uh, and we had an innovation showcase um, of 14 different companies, including Guildford companies. Um, that's Tom Watson playing Guitar Hero. It's one of my favorite pictures. Um, and at that event, we released this, this Blueprint for Growth Policy Report, which still stands. We had five key recommendations. It's all available online. Uh, and this is what we're basing all our lobby on right now, because all of this is going to feed the ecosystem that's going to make your businesses uh, or your ideas um, really become successful. We have to go um, and do the scary evidence giving at select committees. Um, then we get quoted, we do one in Scotland, we do round tables, we take MPs um, on uh, studio visits, which again is incredibly important. I just love, again, as soon as you put a VR headset on the MPs, it's absolutely hysterical to watch, it's brilliant. Um, and this means that things like this happen. So the UK Games Fund, if you haven't heard about it, please do look it up online. It's fantastic, providing prototype funding um, for uh, prototypes, funnily enough. Um, and this is an incredibly, incredibly important initiative. Um, and of course, the Games Tax Relief. Now, in its first year, um, we saw 200, over 237 games receive final or interim certification. Um, the tax man wants to give you money. Um, and this number is quite astounding because when we first did the consultation uh, with government, um, they estimated that there'd be probably around 40 games in the first year that would qualify. There's about 200, about more than 237. Um, and that is providing a really, really, really important incentive in unlocking access to financing, unlocking unlock new routes to um, funding, uh, but also again, giving investors or big companies from outside the UK confidence in what we're doing in the UK. And of course, we're always on the lookout uh, for um, issues down the track, like this one. <laughs> Although, you know, <laughs> we sort of thought that um, we would not be in this position, it uh, is all going to be fine. Um, and again, we have been working very, very hard since Friday to try and answer questions, to get information. Frankly, um, the problem is that no one has the answers yet. Um, but the country is open for business. Nothing is going away. Nothing is disappearing overnight. However, we do need to tackle some of these big questions, particularly around the free movement of people, diverse people. And how do we actually invest more in the homegrown talent as well to make sure that our future is secured? 
that we need highly skilled people from overseas to come and work and choose to set up their lives in this country. And that's what the government wants as well. So there's no way they're not going to let that happen. Okay, it would just not happen. Of course, there's questions over state aid. So the tax relief system, we had to argue to, um, uh, because of state aid rules, which is all about competition in Europe, we had to argue to the Commission uh, for permission um, that this was needed on the basis of uh, incentivizing the production of more culturally relevant games. Um, so, so actually, in fact, uh, for every pound, we know we don't have this stat yet for the games industry, but we're working on this, right? So if you look at the film industry and tax credits, for every pound the tax man or woman gives film uh, production companies, the same scheme as ours, uh, but ours is more flexible, um, the film industry delivers, or the, or the, the um, uh, treasury gets 12 pounds back uh, because it means that more people are spending money, more people are being hired, and ultimately that economic value, people sort of sometimes forget that the tax man and woman's giving you money because they make more money back, and it's all good, it's win-win. It's just we needed permission from Europe. So who knows? It could go either way. We, 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 it could mean that we have more freedom uh, to even raise the amount that you get back. We just don't know yet. And of course, one massive issue is the digital single market. Way too complex to go in today because I've probably run over time already. Um, but accessing 500 million plus consumers uh, across Europe is of critical importance. We are the second biggest consumer market as well for games in Europe after Germany. We must maintain access to the single market, but on the terms that are not going to get away of our innovative business models. We took an actively neutral position. We supported our members. We did two member polls before um, uh, the referendum, and overwhelmingly, they wanted to remain. Um, but we will continue with that support, and we're doing a follow-up poll uh, to see how business confidence is. Uh, despite all of that, so you know, we have a new mayor of London. Um, of course, we are only half an hour from London, and uh, we spent two years bidding for support. We wanted the mayor of London to do for London uh, what he did for do for games, what he did for fashion. Okay, so London Fashion Week became a huge global event, which is very important for the fashion industry. Likewise, uh, we wanted this investment from the mayor, and we did this in partnership with Film London, who are used to doing this, um, to put on a three-year plan. Uh, including a rebirth London Games Festival to disrupt the perception of games publicly uh, and internationally. And uh, we had 38,000 people attending 30 plus events from the uh, during April. And um, we had Now Play This at Somerset House. We had um, a Monopoly board tracking the history of the games industry in Trafalgar Square, which was fantastic. And this was really important. You know, we had these summits, these partners like BAFTA and BFI who hosted um, people like Jonathan Smith talking about the culture of games, uh, talking about showcasing their innovative new games. This is Alex Fleetwood showing um, his new toy to life, Toys to Life game at the, v at the BFI. And of course, the fantastic Siobhan Reddy collecting a multitude of BAFTAs. Um, and BAFTA were part, the BAFTA Awards were part of this. We had Ed Basie uh, doing a speech at an eSports summit and we had a VR summit and we really hope that this um, will continue to, again, make games the heart of entertainment um, and of culture. This was just some of the reach. Um, of course, I'm going to end in a minute. Leading the next generation of talent and helping and supporting um, is still, I'm going to come back to this, is still, I think, the future of us as a sector. We have a student membership scheme, so we find placements for students. We hold a uh, uh, an annual game jam and a student conference. Um, we have the Video Games Ambassador Scheme where anybody from the industry can volunteer to go into schools and talk, so talk, uh, talk, do talks and inspire the next generation. They need to see your faces. They need to see that if you take computer science, it doesn't mean you're going to end up in a white lab coat. Sorry for anyone who wears white lab coats. Um, and most importantly, this needs to be started at a right early age. Uh, eight is too late sometimes and uh, kids, especially girls, um, have stereotypes that kick in, all right? So we need to make sure that doesn't happen. One way we're doing that is through another scheme um, called uh, Digital Schoolhouse. So there's some facts about the VGAs that we have, uh, and I should have gone through those. Um, Digital Schoolhouse, which is a very, very uh, cool project. We've just had at the offices in London um, 
a whole bunch of teachers uh, in for the whole day being trained on how to teach computer science imaginatively and creatively. So this is a, a, a model where the secondary school becomes a hub. They, we teach the, tra uh, the teachers um, using experts and teacher trainers. Uh, we uh, map all the resources, games, um, 3D printing resources, micro bits, etc., onto the curriculum. Uh, a lot of the techniques are um, unplugged, so you can learn about algorithms using uh, dance moves or magic tricks. And it's teaching primary school kids. Okay, so it means that we're, we are trying to reach them at a young age. So I'm just going to finish with a short video um, that just explains it from the kids themselves. imagination, gentlemen. Yeah, just, there was, there's one there. We have a roving mic, I understand. Or do we? And we have another mic. One second. Hi, um, it's just a, a quick question. Uh, with the platform at the inside, uh, we're looking at possibly September, uh, but if you're interested in becoming a, a sort of closed beta tester, I'm happy to. Yeah, that'd yeah. be great. Um, yeah. We actually are on the, the board of Games NI, and mm. it's just about getting some of those companies up on that system Definitely. as well, so they're visible to everybody. It, it, it's only going to succeed and be useful if people actually, you know, if people <laughs> use it and make, make sure, sure that they're engaging with it. That's great. That's brilliant. So, uh, I won't go into the methodology too much, but it's a combination of um, web scraping, it's a combination of combining a lot of the databases that we have, uh, publicly, inf publicly available information, not any confidential information. The main reason for doing this was that official stats, government stats, didn't capture startups. 
And we said, but there's a whole bunch of gazillions. Uh, and, and our map actually shows there's now over 2,000 games and interactive entertainment businesses in the UK. And the majority of them are startups. So this captures startups as long as you're incorporated as a business, as long as you're a business, one person band, doesn't matter. Captures. So as long as you're registered on some like company account. Yeah, exactly. In the right sick code. Everybody check your standard industrial classification code, otherwise you don't get counted. This is another reason why we did this. It's really boring but important. I think Sega, until we told them, were, were listed under um, leisure activities. <laughs> Yeah, we, we fund uh, and run a, a site called Ask About Games. I also sit on the Council for Internet Child Safety. I can never remember the order of the words in which that goes, um, which is really important because it stops stupid shit happening like uh, network level filters that, that put games alongside pornography because they think games are pornography, you know. So we stop that kind of stuff happening. But we educate, we try and educate parents through Ask About Games. Mm -hmm. becomes a forum, a place where parents and carers can come and ask questions. We do. Um, the information about parental controls, about the Peggy age ratings, uh, and we do editorial features about games you like, Lego Dimensions, or offer advice of how, what games you can play as a family uh, and what games your kids should be playing and how to take that creativity offline as well. But it's a constant job and it's a shared responsibility as well. So the careers, we're, we're, we're starting, we're rebooting the site and we want to do some careers advice. Careers advice uh, is also being done by Creative Skills Step uh, in schools and we hope to use the Digital Schoolhouse project which we're now rolling out of London because it was a London pilot. Um, we're rolling that nationwide now um, and hopefully we can, we can use that as a vehicle to do some careers advice. The problem that we have is that we make up our job titles all the time and skill sets like data scientists didn't really exist, you know, or at least as a job. So it is, it is hard if you think about how kids go and find out about jobs. You know, they need sources, they need places to go. They need to be able to Google, you know, and teachers and parents need to know the career pathway so that if you say, you know, little Denny wants to take art and physics, you know, she's not gonna be put off taking art and physics together um, because, oh, the only thing he can be is an architect. So it's really important that we all kind of, that's why the Video Games Ambassador Scheme is incredibly, uh, crucial. Nine times out of ten when I do a school tour, and I do an awful lot of them, and they're, they're the most nerve-wracking things to do, by the way. Um, I headbutted a teacher once and then swore uh, in front of the teacher. <laughs> and then swore again because I'd sworn. Um, but the, the most important thing is to, to, to make sure we're constantly filtering through that information. But nine times out of ten, I get about five kids coming up to me saying, I had no idea my hobby could become a job. I was like, yes! And they all think, you know, the Lego games or Grand Theft Auto, they shouldn't be playing Grand Theft Auto anyway if they're not 18, but they all think that the games are made in, in the US and Japan. I'm like, no, it's just made up the road from you. Hi there, sorry. Um, just wanted a quick question about the schoolhouse stuff. Um, have you had any contact, collaboration, or interaction with um, the other initiatives going on, such as uh, Code Club, Code Dojo? Yeah, uh, all the time. London. Yeah. Because all you the time, there's a lot of repeat, there's a lot of parallel things bringing up. Well, there's, there's parallel. The critical thing about this is this has got massive scale. This is play-based learning. This isn't just coding. Uh, this is creative as well. And this is actually uh, in school time. Okay, this is not an after school club. This is during class time. And, and that is really important. And it's training the teachers not just inspiring the kids at a young age. The teachers need the confidence, the materials, the different ways and techniques and pedagogies to, to, to be you know, built with the industry for them. But yeah, we talked to, we, we had really good relationships with them and we were all part of Make It Digital campaign. Okay, thank you very much again, Joe. Fantastic talk. Thank you so much.